is then again. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the keynote lecture of Professor Philip Kanske today. I will host the session and before introducing Professor Kanske and leaving the floor to him, um, I wanted to say that we will have time for about 10 minutes discussion after the talk. And if anyone has a question but does not want to speak up or is technically inhibited, um, you have the possibility to write your questions in the FAQs and I can read them out later. I'm very happy to introduce Professor Kanske, who is currently Professor for Clinical Psychology and Behavioral Neuroscience at the University Dresden in Germany. And he is an expert for emotional and cognitive processes that support human social behavior. His research targets many very exciting topics such as emotion regulation, metacognition, empathy, mentalizing, and social decision making, of which he aims to understand the underlying neural correlates. Upon finishing his habilitation in 2013 at Heidelberg University, he was already announced by the Association for Psychological Science as one of the rising stars, and since then he received several national and international awards, such as the Hans Meyer Leibniz Award of the German Research Foundation or the Young Investigator Award of the European Brain and Behavior Society. And he has been a member, and I think he's currently also the speaker, of the Young Academy at the German National Academy of Sciences Leop Leopoldina and the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Today, Professor Kanske will talk about the social brain and in more detail about the interacting networks enabling the understanding of others. I think we are all excited to listen to your talk and so without further words from my side, the zoo floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's really great to be here. I'm very honored to be invited. It's my first time at Neuromatch, but I'm a big fan already. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me here. Uh, the social brain, why should you listen to me talk about the social brain? Why would you think about the social brain? I'm going to give you uh, three um, very broad reasons to do so. The first one is that as humans, we are extremely dependent on others from our birth until our deathbed. We really rely on social relationships with others. Uh, in terms of uh, taking care of us, nurturing us, but also in terms of emotional and other support. The social in interactions and social relations we engage in are also incredibly complex. In our everyday life, we kind of manage those social relations, even though they are so complex, uh, relatively well. But it's, uh, it can also become difficult. For some people, it's more difficult than for others. And in some instances, it's more difficult than in other instances. And um, we know that uh, people who have uh, special difficulties in engaging in social relations, uh, that this can be really harmful. Loneliness really is a killer. It's as harmful to your health as uh, smoking. And the, uh, uh, we have some data that we collected during the um, lockdown in spring in Germany uh, due to the uh, coronavirus epidemic and pandemic, actually. And what we see there is that people who are especially vulnerable because of mental health problems in the past, uh, these people, when confronted with, um, when having uh, uh, low social resources, um, develop especially uh, strong mental problems, um, problems with their mental health. So the cap capabilities to uh, build up close friendships, um, the cap capacity to engage in social interactions, even, even daily small social interactions, when you chat with your barista, when you get a coffee, for instance, these little exchanges and the close friendships we have, they uh, really are important for, for our mental health, uh, even for longevity, as has been shown. So what are the capacities that allow us to form these close social relationships and uh, manage our complex social, social nets? Um, what enables us to understand what's going on with other people? When you look at the literature, there's a broad range of processes that are uh, discussed as being important, from affiliation, social attention, to agent identification, biological emotion, empathy, and theory of mind or action understanding. What I will mostly talk about today are empathy and theory of mind. Why? Because I think they are especially important or they have a, a special capacity or a special um, uh, um, characteristic that makes them, them very important. What is empathy of, and what is a theory of mind? They have been defined. Theory of mind is tracking others' intentions, desires, goals, but also emotions. And empathy is sharing others' emotions, yielding an isomorphic, uh, isomorphic effective state, uh, state in yourself. Um, that means an emotional state that is similar to the other. Uh, if you tell me something that is very sad, that makes you sad, and I uh, turn a little bit sad myself, that would be an isomorphic emotional state. So both theory of mind and empathy uh, 
they, what they give us is a representation of another's internal state. They really grant us access to what is going on inside another person's uh, mind. And uh, this is different from, uh, I don't know, uh, biological motion identification or so. These are different uh, important processes as well, of course. But what we also need uh, to understand what, why people act in certain ways is to understand the driving forces behind their actions. And these are their intentions, goals, emotions, and so on, the inner uh, covert mental states. Now, if you're interested in what the neural correlates of uh, empathy and theory of mind are, you're lucky because the research on these capacities has been going on for quite some time, for almost two decades. And there are now also really nice meta-analyses that you can look up uh, when you look at the meta-analyses on theory of mind, for instance, you see that these temporal regions are very much involved, lateral, uh, lateral temporal regions, the temporal parietal junction, for instance, but also reaching up to the temporal poles, and these anterior and posterior midline regions. Um, when you look at empathy uh, meta-analyses, what you see is that the anterior insula seems to be very important, but also anterior cingulate cortex. Um, now, a problem with these meta-analyses that have been done so far is that these are really pooled meta-analyses across a wide variety of different tasks. Um, and in a way, you can think of this as, uh, um, because the tasks that have been used to study empathy and theory of mind are very, very diverse, what, what these pooled meta-analyses do is that they kind of throw apples and oranges into the same basket. And we don't really know um, what... Um, uh, uh, what the specific processes are that might be specific uh, to uh, empathy and theory of mind. And also, we don't really know, um, when we look at these um, functions separately, how they work together, which they probably do in more complex social interactions. Um, another issue is that um, in the field, the terms are used uh, quite uh, diversely as well. You will not only find empathy and theory of mind as clear cut as I've kind of uh, pictured uh, the simplistic picture now, you will also find terms like cognitive empathy, effective theory of mind, for instance. And um, they will also be used uh, interchangeably. Sometimes empathy is used as an umbrella term for all kinds of processes. So what people do is they name their task when they publish something as an empathy task, for instance, or a theory of mind task. But uh, it's not really clear whether the processes, and then they go into these meta-analyses, but it's not really clear what the processes are that are in these uh, specific tasks. So uh, Matthias Schutz and I uh, and a couple of our colleagues, we set out to uh, bring a little bit of order into this big picture. And what we did is we um, looked at the literature and uh, what we wanted to do is kind of um, sort uh, the uh, literature on empathy and theory of mind and uh, include as many tasks as possible in an overarching meta-analysis. Um, so let's start with the empathy tasks that we found. Um, what we looked at here are really um, very different groups of tasks. For instance, tasks uh, where people had to observe others in pain, observe others' emotions. Um, to, they were really uh, explicitly instructed to share others' emotions or others' pain or to evaluate situated emotions, that is uh, emotions that are in, uh, embedded in more complex situations, or reasoning about emotions, that is um, situations where you really are to, supposed to, um, uh, um, to deduce something about the emotion or some action based on the emotion of the other. And now, uh, um, what you can do when you have these different task groups, you can do meta analyses of the tasks that fall within each of these task groups. Instead of just averaging all of these empathy tasks together, you can look at the different task groups separately. And what this yields is a lot of uh, brain images. You basically get for each task group a meta analysis. And now you can already see that there are some commonalities across all of these tasks. So they do seem to share something. For instance, activation in the anterior insula seems to be present across almost all of these tasks to some degree. But there are also differences. For instance, you can see that reasoning about emotions engages these temporal varietal regions quite strongly, while many of the other tasks don't really do that. Um, um, you see some uh, activation in these lateral, dorsal, and uh, reaching into parietal regions here, but not so much in all of the other tasks. So there are some differences already here on, that you can visually see when you look just at the, at the maps here. We did the same for theory of mind. Um, here we collected um, uh, another range of different tasks, false belief tasks, trade judgments, strategic games where you engage with others in a, in a dietic exec or with other people um, in, a, in an exchange, social animations, 
rational actions or reading the mind in the eyes that has been used quite extensively also. And again, you can do meta analyses across all of these task groups. And again, you get a lot of uh, brain maps that uh, share some things you see across most of these task groups, for instance, this anterior midline uh, activation, precuneus activation, uh, temporal parietal activation, but you also see quite a lot of differences between these tasks. You see um, anterior insular activation for reading the mind in the eyes, for instance, but not for the other task groups. Um, and there are some other differences as well. So now we have all these different brain maps coming from these very diverse and, and different task groups that have been termed empathy and or theory of mind. Um, and what, uh, what one can do now with all these maps is that um, you can use the data to actually find commonalities um, um, and differences between these task groups. You can kind of use the data, a data-driven approach to group them together. And this is what uh, Matthias did in a meta-analytic hierarchical clustering analysis. Uh, what it gives you is kind of a dendrogram like this one. On the axis down here, you see all of the different task groups that I just presented to you. For instance, from the theory of mind group, the false belief task, or from the uh, empathy group, the observing pain task. And you can see that they are based on, based on the maps that I just showed you. They are grouped together very closely or further apart, depending on how similar the meta-analytic maps of these different task groups are. And maybe you can already, when you look at these, visually group them into bigger clusters. Um, and this is also what uh, statistics can give you. Uh, when you do so, um, one solution that uh, statistics will tell you is a good one for uh, clustering these is um, a three cluster solution. This would group together um, a couple of groups, a uh, task from the theory of mind group in a cognitive cluster, um, a couple of groups, a uh, task from the empathy group in the effective cluster. Interestingly, also one task from the uh, theory of mind group, the reading the mind in the eyes. People who are familiar with that task might know that uh, it really heavily depends on emotion. Um, we are presented with just the eye region of, uh, of, of uh, faces, basically, um, and usually they express some type of emotion and you're supposed to um, uh, think about what that emotion might be. And this seems uh, to be, in terms of what the activations look like, to be closely related to uh, some other uh, empathy task rather than with uh, the clear-cut theory of mind task here. And you can also see that there's an intermediate cluster here. In that intermediate cluster, you see uh, situated emotions, reasoning about emotions, rational actions, and social animations. These are tasks from the theory of mind and from the empathy group that are a little bit more complex than the just observing pain in others, for instance. Um, and uh, interestingly, these tasks seem to um, be more related to one another than to the other empathy and theory of mind tasks. And what I'm going to do in the next uh, for the next slide is explore a little bit uh, what uh, these different clusters uh, are, what they look like, and also especially what this intermediate cluster might be doing. Um, is it a special type of social cognition, or is it something that is made up of uh, uh, the processes that are also engaged in in the cognitive uh, theory of mind and the effective empathy cluster? Before I do that, however, I want to uh, tell you also that there's also an eight cluster solution. This is basically a solution where um, you get all, you're almost on the task group level here. You have a lot of different clusters. And this just tells you that there's also a lot of variance in the data that is really specific to the different tasks, um, which is also interesting in itself, but a, a little bit a different story than what I have time to tell you today. All right, now when you have these, um, uh, these different classes here, you can also look at the brain maps that you would get if you look at, uh, for instance, a meta-analysis of the uh, cognitive cluster. And uh, this is what, what you see here. You have the brain map that would be associated with the cognitive cluster here on the left. You see anterior posterior midline regions and these temporal regions again. And um, you see um, the uh, map for the effective cluster on the right with the anterior insula, for instance, and anterior cingulate cortex. And what you also see is that uh, the intermediate cluster um, seems to combine a little bit um, activations um, in regions that you also see for the cognitive and the effective cluster. Um, you do have anterior insula on both sides here, which you get from the effective cluster, but you also have all these temporal regions that you would get from the cognitive cluster. So just from this view, uh, one might uh, generate the hypothesis that the intermediate cluster really is um, a combination of um, 
activation in the networks associated with empathy, the effective cluster, and uh, this cognitive theory of mind clustering. Just for the sake of completeness, I'm also going to show you the eight cluster solution, uh, which just uh, shows you that um, there seems to be really a kind of hierarchical organization in, in social cognition. Um, then I'm also not going to go too much into detail right now. Um, now, people who are familiar with resting state data um, might already see that uh, what is described as theory of mind-related activity is really closely resembling, resembling what people know as the default mode network. Um, while uh, the activation in the effective cluster resembles more um, activation in the salience, eventual attention network, and maybe the frontal parietal network. And uh, what we try to do is also to um, make use of, um, uh, of resting state um, uh, approaches to see where our clusters would be positioned and whether we can find commonalities and differences between the clusters. But before I move to that, um, we can also um, see here uh, in a neurosense decoding um, what the what functions or what terms in, in terms of uh, neurosense decoding the different classes are related to. As you can see, the um, uh, effective cluster is related to phase, effective fear, pain. Uh, the cognitive cluster is related to theory of mind, mentalizing, um, and terms like that. And what you can critically also see is that the intermediate cluster is a kind of a mixture of both. So in, um, as we already kind of generated the hypothesis from the from the just uh, the maps, uh, in terms of neurosense decoding, you would also um, uh, uh, that would strengthen that hypothesis that the intermediate cluster isn't something entirely different, but it is a combination of what you see for the cognitive and effective cluster. Now we move to the resting state data. Um, what we make use of here is a data analysis um, from Daniel Marcolis. What he did is he used the resting state data to come up with a uh, principal gradient of a macro uh, scale cortical organization. Um, you get different um, uh, uh, principal com com components if you look at large scale organization of resting state data and uh, the um, main principal gradient would be this one. It ranges from sensory unimodal regions to abstract transmodal regions. And as you can see, the sensory unimodal regions are in, for instance, in the visual cortex, but also in the uh, somatosensory and motor cortex. Um, the abstract transmodal regions are in the anterior and posterior midline and also in the temporal pattern junction and the uh, temporal lobe reaching to the temporal pole. So this is basically the default mode network. And we can now look at where, or that's what we did, we looked at our three clusters, where would the, they be positioned on this gradient? And as you can see here, the cognitive cluster is mainly being uh, positioned on the far right end of the cluster, on the abstract and transmodal um, end. The effective cluster has its main overlap with um, the media, middle part of the, of the gradient, and the intermediate cluster kind of overlaps with both. It has a uh, um, um, particular um, overlap in the middle range, but also in the abstract transmodal regions. Again, arguing for uh, this middle cluster being um, kind of a combination of processes that are distinct when we look at um, cognitive and effective functions uh, so very separately. Um, and this is actually a quite interesting finding because from the resting state literature, what we know is that um, these regions um, that are positioned in the middle part and in the far abstract part here, they are more non or, at, or even anti-correlated. And for these more complex social tasks, it seems like they are nevertheless jointly co-activated. Um, now, we uh, uh, took this one step further, and this is work by Lara Maliska and uh, Matthias Schutz also, and we looked at um, when we try to see what regions um, uh, are co-activated um, across many tasks um, with the different regions, what would we see there? Are there differences also between the different clusters? And um, I'm putting up the classes here again. What we did here in order to do this meta-analytic co-activation um, mapping is to derive from the overall network, basically, when you put all of the empathy and theory of mind tasks together and you great, create something that would be something like the social brain, um, when you um, use uh, derived regions of interest from this, what you end up is uh, the temporal private junction, the insula, and also uh, posterior singlet cortex and anterior singlet cortex. And for these two now, I'm going to show you what the co-activation maps would look like. Um, for the insula first, as you can see here, um, here are the tasks in the cognitive cluster, and we can see what the tasks in the cognitive cluster 
uh, which regions co-activate with the insula in that cluster. And as you can see, these are regions in the anterior posterior midline regions and in the temporal pole, a little bit in the temporal parietal, parietal junction. For the uh, effective cluster, it's a very different picture. You see the anterior cingulate, uh, anterior insula, um, um, and these inferior uh, frontal regions, um, anterior insula bilaterally. Um, and now, interestingly, again, the intermediate cluster, as you can see here, the intermediate cluster is again a bit a mixture of both with these anterior posterior midline regions, but also the anterior insula. How does the picture look like for the temporal parietal junction? Um, here, tasks that fall in the cognitive cluster, um, for those, the temporal parietal junction co-activates again with anterior posterior midline regions, temporal parietal junction bilaterally. Um, for the task in the effective cluster, the temporal parietal junction co-activates with different uh, regions, namely um, the anterior insula again, for instance. And again, the intermediate cluster is a little bit in the middle. Okay, now this is very interesting and it tells us that these networks apparently start cooperating, but that they can also be apparently separated in some tasks. If you really want to know how they cooperate and how they are linked together, what you need to do is you need to measure um, empathy and theory of mind within the same participants in the same type of task. And this is what we try to do in this task here. We named it the empathom because it's supposed to measure empathy and theory of mind. What does it look like? You're presented with a short video clip and the video your clip, the uh, narrator tells you a short um, story that can be either emotional or neutral. And after that story, you're being asked how you feel yourself right now. With the logic being that if you feel more negative after an emotionally negative video, you empathically shared the emotion of that person. And this is actually what people report. In that rating, they rate their only effective states to be subjectively more negative after the emotional videos than after the neutral videos. And this goes along with activation in a widespread network, including also the anterior insula on both sides and a couple of other regions overlapping with uh, meta-analyses. As you can see in the white outlines, this is a meta-analysis on empathy tasks. The combined activation in these regions also moderately correlates uh, with the ratings. Now the task goes on and uh, you're presented with a question and the question comes in two flavors. Um, either you're asked what Anna thinks, so you're asked about the mental state of the uh, narrator, or it's a factual question about the content of the video. Um, this is kind of our control condition. This is the, the theory of mind condition. If we contrast the two, what we get is activation in a different network, um, you get all these temporal regions and anterior and posterior midline regions, regions that you also saw, saw before and that overlap also with the uh, meta-analysis on theory of mind. Um, again, if you combine activation here, it moderately correlates with, uh, uh, with behavior. The better you are, the stronger your activation moderately is gonna be. Okay, now uh, as we can uh, apparently test both functions with this task. We can also look at the specifics and this is what we did here. We directly contrasted empathy and theory of mind. And when you do this, um, you see very clearly and uh, um, concisely the networks that we've seen uh, already um, for empathy, for instance, the interior insula, empathy versus theory of mind. For theory of mind versus empathy, you get all the temporal regions and also these uh, anterior posterior midline regions, for instance. Um, uh, we positioned these also in resting states, so seeded from, from the task-related regions here um, in, in resting state. And what we get is irrespective of where we start to, uh, to seed is different networks with uh, the typical default mode regions related to the theory of mind peaks and the typical salience regions, including the anterior insula related to, um, to the peaks that were derived from empathy activations. So also in resting state, it seems like we can really dissociate these networks. Um, now, there are also other ways to look at this, um, and we can, for instance, also directly correlate, uh, um, correlate the two functions with this task as we assess it in the same people. When we do this um, in terms of behavior, either within the task or when averaging across different empathy and theory of mind tasks, we do not see any correlation whatsoever. And also in terms of the activation, irrespective of how we derive it directly, directly from the task, there's no correlation here. So it seems like also on an inter-individual level, these networks, at least they can be separate and they can uh, vary separately. If this is the case, then what we would also expect is these networks to be um, differentially changeable. 
And uh, in terms of inter-individual differences, we look, for instance, at people who are aggressive offenders. These are people who have all committed serious bodily harm to other people. And what we see here is that they are not different from controls in terms of theory of mind, but they rate, at least subjectively, that they feel less uh, empathy with the, with the person uh, than in the control group. In contrast, in aging, we see a theory of mind deficit. So older adults are less good in, in answering uh, the theory of mind questions compared to the young adults, but they are not different in terms of empathy. They feel with the other as much as uh, the young adults do. So in terms of uh, older adults and aggressive people, we can see that uh, differential patterns of uh, impairment in these two functions. We can also see um, that we can induce short-term plasticity. Um, um, for instance, by music, if you play emotional music along, you see that people rate um, their emotions, they rate that they empathically share the other's emotions a little bit stronger than if the music that was played was neutral. Um, and this has no effect on accuracy or reaction times in the theory of mind questions. So also in terms of short-term plasticity, you can differentiate the two, selectively target one, and um, you can also look at long-term plasticity. Um, this is uh, um, a study uh, done by uh, Sophie Falk and Mathis Tautwein, um, together with many other people, including me, uh, where we did training um, 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 people engaged in a three-month module that focused cognitive functions, for instance, via an observing thoughts meditation, or that it had, it had uh, targeted effective functions, for instance, a loving kindness meditation. And after three months of doing this, um, we see after this uh, cognitive module, an increase in theory of mind performance compared to the other groups, um, the active control group, this task here, um, or a passive free test control group. And we see an increase in compassion uh, also compared um, to uh, the cognitive module or the retest control group. And now interestingly, this behavioral increase is also related to an increase in cortical thickness. For instance, in the uh, anterior insula, um, the stronger uh, the increase in cortical thickness here, the more uh, the people have um, increased in their compassion scores after the training. Compassion being a social emotion like empathy, a little bit different, but also associated. And uh, the more you increase in cortical thickness in this temporal parietal region, the stronger your increase in theory of mind performance after the cognitive module will be. So also in terms of long-term plasticity, it seems like we really can differentiate these two functions. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, oh, I wanted to highlight uh, yeah, a, shout, a big shout out for Sophie Falk's talk. It's already happened. <laughs> it was earlier today. Um, Sophie Falk did the structural uh, uh, um, cortical thickness analysis here. Uh, also had a really nice talk on, on resting state data from the study. Um, if you want to have a look at it, I can only recommend it. It's, uh, uh, even though it happened, it's now, of course, online and you can still have a look at it. Okay. Um, so what we saw is that the networks really are differentiable. This um, uh, is in line with what we also saw from the meta-analysis, uh, the big one that we do, when we look at all the tasks in the field, we do get a cognitive and effective cluster. So they are separable. Um, and they are also quite independent in the sense that they can be independent. They can not, uh, uh, under some circumstances, they are not correlated. They can, can also be um, selectively impaired or enhanced um, through training or inductions like music, for instance. Nevertheless, uh, you can also ask whether in some situations these networks start cooperating or uh, in somehow in some way um, being related to another uh, interacting in some way. And uh, as we tested in our task, uh, both functions at the same time, we can look at this and we did this uh, with dynamic causal modeling. We selected two regions of interest, um, the anterior insula uh, for as a kind of a prime um, part of the um, empathy related network and the temporal parietal junction as one of the prime regions related to a theory of mind. And when you look at the relation of these two um, regions, what you see is that in emotional situations, um, when emotion is high, basically, we see an inhibition of activity in the temporal parietal junction by activation in the anterior insula. Um, so in these uh, emotional videos, there uh, we see such an inhibitory influence and interestingly, this is related to reduced performance in the theory of mind questions, basically in questions like Anna thinks that ABC. 
So um, uh, what this means is that um, in some situations in our task uh, um, uh, where we have very strong emotional situations, very strong emotional stories, um, it can be that um, uh, the net empathy related network has an inhibitory influence on the theory of mind network, but it also means that these networks start interacting under some circumstances. Um, together also with Lara Maliske, what we did is um, we looked, uh, this is basically our study, um, together with uh, Lara Maliske and Schutz, uh, Matthias Schutz, we uh, looked, uh, tried to find as many studies uh, that did this type of um, effective connectivity between uh, different networks in um, social tasks and uh, kind of review um, what, uh, what the connectivity re really looks like. For our task, as I just showed, we found this inhibitory um, influence of the insula on the TBJ. Um, the networks that, uh, that interact here would be in terms of resting state networks be related to the default mode network and the frontal parietal network. Now we found six other studies that also looked at uh, effective connectivity uh, between different networks during social tasks. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the pattern becomes relatively complex, especially the more regions are in there, it can be super complex. And I'm not gonna be able to discuss all that in detail today, but my point, the point that I want to make here is that um, it really is the case that these networks start interacting um, in more complex social situations. What we saw from the meta-analysis is that there are a couple of tasks that are intermediate, where the networks are somehow co-active, um, we know that they um, can be jointly active. We don't really know how they are related. These studies here now uh, give a first hint at how they might be related, but I think we're just scratching the surface here on um, how uh, in more real life, more complex social interactions, um, these networks might start to interact. And this is in my view, kind of what we, what we also need to engage in next is uh, have people do more complex social tasks, have different networks um, being active and uh, look at their interrelation to be better able to explain things. All right, so I'm uh, coming to an end. Uh, I hope I'm still in time. To summarize quickly, um, on a meta-analytic level, uh, within task and uh, within subject, um, we can differentiate these two networks related to empathy and theory of mind. Um, we see a non-correlation if you look at correlation. We also see that in development, for instance, or psychopathology, they can be differentiated, they can be selectively impaired, arguing for independence of these networks, um, and also in these functions, and also uh, they can be differentially plastic in terms of um, what you train um, specifically. Nevertheless, we also see uh, co-activation and even interaction of these networks in some tasks. And uh, I think um, in, this happens in more complex, more naturalistic social situations. And if you really want to understand what's going on in actual uh, social interactions um, in more complex situations, when it becomes difficult, I think as, uh, as I just said, uh, what we need to do is engage in um, more realistic uh, social, social neuroscience and look at the interaction of these networks also. With this, I'm coming to an end. I would like to thank all the people in the lab in Dresden. It's uh, incredible fun to work with you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I would also like to thank Matthias Schutz, who is uh, the best co uh, collaborator you can think of. Um, um, and also Mattes, uh, Anne Böckler, Mattes Trautwein, Anne Böckler, and Sophie Falk, who contributed a lot, um, and who are also the best collaborators you can think of. And of course, also other people who contributed, especially also Tanja Singer. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you for your really great and interesting talk, Philip. And uh, yeah, I would open now the question session and um, maybe I start with one question which has been written in the chat um, really at the beginning, um, because I think it's also a, a large question that is related to the bigger topic of the talk. And um, oh, it's already, ah, yes. Yeah, um, the first question was, I don't quite understand why or whether one should divide empathy and Tom in cognitive and affective forms or not, just in general, not related to the talk, um, is meant by the comments. So why would we differentiate between those two? It's an incredibly good question. Uh, I think this is, uh, it, it comes a little bit from the uh, terminological turmoil that is going on in the social neuroscience field or uh, in the field that looks at these processes in general, maybe. Um, 
in my view, um, these terms have been used for very different things by different people, and I'm not attached to any particular usage. Um, so my, my, my argument really is that um, we need to be careful in what we mean, and we need to differentiate some things, and uh, for those, it might be helpful to use different terms. So for instance, empathy has uh, quite often been used as an umbrella term, referring to um, perspective taking, theory of mind basically, um, to um, uh, empathy or affect sharing, um, and also to uh, compassion in some cases. And um, from looking at the neural evidence and also the evidence I showed here, I think what is relatively clear is that we need to differentiate between functions like perspective taking, affect sharing, and also compassion. I didn't go into detail with that, but compassion is also a little bit different. And um, when we know that we need to differentiate between those, uh, those functions, I think what it tells us is that it, it would be good to use different terms for referring to these so that we don't get uh, this mix up. Um, so in my view, in my ideal world, uh, uh, I would um, um, use a data-driven approach like we did with the meta-analysis a little bit um, and look at um, what functions group together and then find terms that ideally describe these. And then um, if you call uh, empathy effect sharing or empathy, I don't really mind. I, I just want to make sure that you differentiate it from something like cognitive uh, perspective taking. And cognitive empathy, uh, for instance, and effective theory of mind have often been used for um, cognitive empathy as a, as an, a synonym for theory of mind, um, uh, which is fine with me as long as you, you're clear on what you, want to, what, what you want to say with it. It might be easier to just your theory of mind or mentalizing to make it a clear distinction um, to affect sharing or empathy. And effective theory of mind has often also been used uh, to refer to um, uh, deducing others' effect. And um, depending on the nature of the task, I think um, you don't really need to engage into effective processing in order to deduce others' effect, but you might in some cases do so. Um, in some of the tasks that fall into our Im intermediate cluster, these are tasks where you actually do that, where people um, are asked about the emotions of the others in a complex manner. Um, and that seems to engage both networks, as I showed. Um, but there might also be situations where you are on a very abstract level reasoning about the emotions of the others and not emotionally engage yourself. And this should only activate uh, regions related to theory of mind then. Do you think we also need to differentiate between empathy um, in positive and negative um, emotions and also in cognitive? In yeah, in absolutely. Um, so uh, um, I think um, uh, I, I, what I spoke about today mainly is uh, empathy for negative emotions of others. And um, as I said earlier, empathy is, um, is, a, is a function that yields an isomorphic uh, emotional state to the isomorphic to the emotional state of the, between the observer and the observed person. So um, if if it is sadness that I share with the other, it's a negative emotion and regions that are related to my own sadness will be active when I share the other person's sadness. If I um, uh, share somebody's joy, um, the regions that are typically associated with joy uh, will be activated. Um, and these are different regions than the regions associated with, uh, with, with sadness or grief, for instance. Uh, there's, for instance, a study uh, where they looked at, uh, at a game show and uh, the people either won the game show themselves or somebody else won the game show. And if it was somebody who is um, a nice guy, uh, people started sharing the emotion with the other. They were happy for the other that he or she won the lottery. And uh, this uh, yielded activation um, in the ventral striatum, both when observing the other winning the lottery, but also when winning the lottery oneself. So for, for empathy or affect sharing, I think we really need to be clear on what the emotion is. And positive and negative uh, might be relatively uh, sensible categories here. Um, for theory of mind, um, the knowledge that you create or the representation, if you want to call it representation, that you create uh, is an abstract propositional one. So um, in that sense, it should be independent of the modality. I can, um, I can uh, share your thoughts on the future, on the past. I can share your emotions. I can share your intentions. If they are represented in an abstract propositional manner, then the network that does that shouldn't be too different. Um, and when you look at the network that enables theory of mind, it's basically the default mode network that is also engaged in episodic prospection and episodic memory, for instance, and also in mind wandering. So instances where um, you're 
uh, thoughts are decoupled from what is currently going on in the outside world. Um, you're either mentalizing about yourself in the future, yourself in the past, or somebody else's mind. And um, all of these activate the same network, which gives to me the impression that it's really an abstract uh, amodal thing uh, that is going on and, um, and you don't really have specific patterns. Um, there might be some specificity within that network, but the regions itself uh, shouldn't be too different. Well, that's interesting. So maybe many networks for uh, empathy then depending on the emotion. <laughs> There's one other uh, comment, which I would want to read out. Um, it's, or it's a question that you could comment uh, on the similarity of the TOM and the default mode network um, with a semantic network, which is quite similar to the intermediate cluster network you expressed. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, also a really good question. So the, um, um, I showed a couple of, of, of data sets where we uh, seem to show quite clearly that the regions engaged in theory of mind um, really are the ones that are also, that they fall within the default mode network quite uh, relatively well. If you want to have an, a, a correct estimate, you can look at um, the Cortex paper that I cited, uh, Matthias Schutz, uh, Lara Maliska, and myself in Cortex this year, um, where we um, really computed, calculated the overlap of different theory of mind task activations with the default mode network. Um, and uh, it's quite extensive, uh, especially for the false belief task um, or trade judgments, for instance. And uh, as I just said earlier, I think it makes sense if you think about the default mode network as one that is uh, on the abstract amodal end of this gradient, uh, principal gradient of macro uh, scale cortical um, functioning, um, cortical organization. And um, it allows uh, this abstract representation probably of, of, uh, of information, um, which is um, required for mentalizing about all kinds of things uh, going on the other's minds. And in that paper, we also uh, calculated the overlap of the empathy tasks uh, with resting state networks. And the, the picture there is a little bit more diverse, but it's uh, basically the um, uh, front of parietal network and also the uh, ventral attention network, the salience network um, that are mostly maybe um, uh, uh, where the uh, overlap is strongest. And um, these are networks also that we know are engaged in, in uh, salience and uh, um, uh, in, in emotional is a signal of salience. And uh, so I think it, it makes sense in that regard. Um, uh, in terms of language, uh, I think it was semantic uh, uh, processing the, for the intermediate cluster. Um, when we did the um, neurosense decoding, um, we did indeed get also some terms from the uh, language uh, field uh, broadly. Um, I'm not so sure if it's um, language specific. Um, I, uh, I think in terms of uh, the Neurosense database, what one can say is that um, there are really many language studies in there. So uh, you do get language terms also because there are just that, that many uh, studies from that field in there. So um, that doesn't make it specific, but it may be that some things are shared. Um, to be honest, I. I'm not, I haven't thought that through yet uh, um, to, uh, uh, to the extent that I would make speculations right now, but it's a good point and uh, one should probably do it at some point. Maybe we have yes. time for one last question before the time is uh, running out. Um, the question is, how do you understand the inhibition effect from anterior insula to TPJ in BCM analysis? Does it mean anterior insula increase or decrease activation in TPJ under emotion conditions? Yeah, um, also good question. Um, thanks. Um, it, it explicitly means that um, the anterior insula inhibits TPJ. It inhibits uh, activity in the temporal parietal junction. And as we saw, this has effects on how well you mentalize. Um, it decreases your performance in the, uh, in the theory of mind questions that come later. Um, what this, uh, how you can interpret this is, um, I think, in, in, the, in an kind of emotion distraction sense um, that uh, if you are yourself in a strong emotional, highly emotional situation, um, um, uh, as we saw, as we can see for many other emotional tasks, uh, emotions can be distracting from other cognitive tasks. They can somehow deduce uh, deductive resources from, from um, if you want to use the term resource, uh, um, uh, 
and impair performance. And this is a little bit what we see here. I think an evolutionary function might be that uh, if something emotional going, is going on in the outside world, um, emotion, as I said, means salience. It's a salient event that you want to orient attention to immediately. You don't, you don't want to mentalize too much about the other. In that instance, you, you want to be able to act fast to that salient emotional uh, situation going on outside. And that's why maybe the uh, TPJ is inhibited. It's a pattern that you also see in attention tasks, for instance, that um, and here insula inhibits um, uh, default mode network activity, for instance, in highly salient situations or task uh, control situations. Um, so in that sense, I, I think it makes sense to, to see that pattern here. But I could imagine that there are also other situations where the networks more work together, where, um, for instance, the uh, default mode network kind of reads out the information from the insular to inform what type of emotion is really present in the moment. Or, And as we saw from the um, um, overview of all the effective connectivity studies, the patterns are quite complex. And one really needs to look in the details of the tasks, uh, what might be going on. Thanks a lot. Actually, we are quite exactly in time, so I'm not sure if the session will end in a few seconds. I want to thank you a lot for your talk. I think there are many open questions, um, which you will hopefully answer in later talks at some point. <laughs> and I thank also, all maybe of you just for let me uh, add that um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to uh, text me and um, I'm happy to respond also if I uh, uh, have the time. So um, that would be great. Uh, get in touch if you're, if you're interested in our research or have questions. That's a great opportunity. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thanks for all who shared the questions with us and the discussion. And have a nice evening. Bye. Take care. <laughs>